This weekend, we prepare to celebrate the 130th anniversary of St. Stanislaus Kaska Polish Catholic Church in St. Louis, Missouri. And so, for the sake of those who are preparing to travel to St. Louis this evening, we have a helpful lesson on Polish Catholicism, particularly within the independent Catholic tradition here in the United States, which I think will be eye-opening and fascinating for all of us, those of us who will be here in Austin praying for our friends in St. Louis, and also for the delegation of eight persons that we're sending to St. Louis this weekend. Are we ready? Mm-hmm. The history of Catholicism in Poland. So, did you know, today, some 88 to 92 percent of Polish people, Poles they call themselves, self-identify as Catholic. 88 to 92 percent of people. Hmm, how does that compare with Mexico? Mexico is a very religious country, correct? Mm-hmm. In fact, Mexico is down in terms of religious self-identification. When I first went to Mexico more than 30 years ago, some 98 percent of the population self-identified in terms of per capita polls has a higher percentage of people who self-identify as Catholic. How did the nation become Catholic? Back in 966 AD, over a thousand years ago, Duke Mietzko I of the Pius dynasty, likely influenced by his wife, Dubrovka, and he was baptized along with his court on Holy Saturday, the day before Easter Sunday, in the year 966, and the Polish people tend to point to that event as the beginning of their of their uh, existence as a nation. They became a Polish people, a Polish nation, on that day. Now, of course, as we'll later see, Poland did not come into existence until 1918. So before 1918, what today is Poland was divided into several other smaller lands. Like Emperor Constantine, have we heard his story before in the fourth century? Mitzko saw Christianity as a unifying force that would strengthen his hold on power. So Constantine said, if I could just get everyone believing the same religion, believing in the same God, professing the same thing, going to the same churches, then they would all they would create this power structure, and I could be at the head of this power structure. Mitzko, the Duke of Kurende Poland, had the same idea. Let's get everyone believing the same religion. At that time, present-day Poland was comprised of four territories, so at that time that would have been Great Poland, Little Poland, Matsovia, and Silesia, and then present-day Poland we know to, would be established at the end of World War I with the Treaty of Versailles in 1918, we would see the birth of Poland as it exists today. Christianity came in 966 AD. What did they worship in Poland before then? Various pagan religions. If you listen to Father Marek speak, sometimes he'll speak of the various pagan religions that used to be in Poland before the coming of Christianity, because there are different pagan beliefs that persist to the present day. (coughs) They worshiped Svetovid, the Slavic pagan god of war and abundance. And then after 966, we started setting up the church both the structure of the church, but also the physical churches. We started building churches all over Poland. Have you heard of St. Stanislaus Saint Stanislaus before? So that's the patron saint of the church in St. Louis, but also many Polish churches throughout the United States are named for St. Stanislaus. So the question is, who was St. Stanislaus? St. Stanislaus Kowski <coughs> was the bishop of Krakow, a large city in Poland, <coughs> lived from 1030 to 1079, and was an early patron saint of Poland. Why? Because the king excommuni- he excommunicated the king, King Boleslaus II, both for his cruelty to the people and also for his sexual promiscuity. And so the king sent soldiers to kill Stanislaus, Bishop Stanislaus, while he was celebrating mass. Can you imagine the mass is a very public act? So if you want to know where the priest or the bishop or the cardinal is going to be on any given Sunday or any given day, you know, oh, it's mass time. They sent soldiers to <clears throat> cut him into pieces while he was celebrating mass. So, of course, he became a great saint of the Polish people, similar to Thomas a Becket in England. If you heard the story of Thomas a Becket, same thing. The king of England wanted to kill him, sent soldiers to kill him while he was celebrating mass. 
Closer to the present day, half of all Polish Catholic priests were killed in concentration camps during World War II. We know that the Holocaust, over six million Polish people lost their lives during the Holocaust. <clears throat> half of the Polish priests, Roman Catholic priests in Poland were killed. The most famous of which you may have heard of St. Maximilian Kolbe. Have you heard of him? St. Maximilian Kolbe was the Franciscan priest who was sent to the concentration camp. So as a saint, you'll often see him dressed like an Auschwitz prisoner in like one of the, the gray uniforms. Yeah. <clears throat> he was the one who, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the uh, Nazis had decided they were going to kill one person, I believe as a result of someone escaping or trying to escape from the prison. And so they said, we're going to kill one person, we're going to kill you. And, and it was St. Maximilian Kolbe who said, I will die in the place of that man. That man later was released from the uh, concentration camps at the end of the war and lived to be like 90 some years old. So it's a beautiful story of him in old age with his wife. Close to our day, some of us may remember 1978. Were any of us alive back then? 58-year-old Cardinal, Polish Cardinal Karol Wojtyla of Krakow was elected. What name did he take? John Paul II. Uh, so that became certainly a source of pride. That was the first non-Italian pope in hundreds of years. So for him to be from the very Catholic country of Poland was a great source of pride for the, for the Polish people. We'll pause there. Any questions or comments so far before we before we talk about Polish Catholicism coming to the United States, Vincent? So, in World War uh, One or Two, when Jewish people were killed and were to concentrate. Uh -huh. um, so in Poland, it was just all the Polish people, or not just the religion part. Of it. Because if it was a lot of Catholics there, but it was just mostly Polish people that were killed. Concentration camps. Was it only Polish people? No, it was, it was certainly it was many people of various nationalities, but it was there were more than six million Polish people. Uh, Ninety percent of Polish Jews were killed during the Holocaust. So it's primarily so we we recall historically Adolf Hitler was Catholic himself, and he persecuted. He had this idea that we needed to cleanse the human race of the Jewish people. We this is. It's hard, difficult for us to fathom today, but it was for that reason that he went on this genocide, the genocide of, of the Jewish people. So this time in history. So they singled out all the Catholic, uh, Polish Catholic uh, clergy. Uh, they didn't single out all of them. About half, about half of the. Polish well, I mean, they, they they pretty much singled them out because they were Catholic <clears throat> clergy. Maybe. That's an excellent they, question. I don't know enough of the history of that period to know why they singled them out. What I do know, what we do know is that about half of them died mm. in the concentration camps. Quite a treaty. I'm imagining, I'm just thinking, you know, you know, the place, if, if a priest, a priest has a certain position of influence in the community, and so if that priest is going to say or do anything that goes against what at that time was the Nazi regime, that would have been a, that would have been a danger. And I'm imagining that the, would have had some influence on the decision. Mario? But did Hitler use the church <coughs> against the Jewish people? Did Hitler uh, use the church against the Jewish people? I haven't read anything about that part. But yeah. Certainly there are books on how it is that the Roman Catholic Church was very silent during this time. And you've got to imagine, you know, if you have a, a fascist dictator like Hitler, you know, how do you respond if you are, for instance, the Pope or a bishop in a certain place, you know, so the, there are many people who look at the Roman Catholic Church at that time, Pius XII was the Pope, you know, they see him as being largely complicit in the events of that age. That, 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 that would be a tough, you know, it's hard, difficult for us to judge them looking back knowing what we know 75 years later. But he was Catholic and was I Catholic. remember way back then when I was going to just catechism, but uh, some of the nuns would say that Jewish people killed God, Jesus. And <laughs> yeah, so I mean, the word that we'll throw up on the board is anti-Semitism, which means what? Anti-Semitism. 
Chizm is something that we as Catholics have to be really careful about. Because remember, up until the Second Vatican Council, we talked about how it was that Jews killed Jesus. And so by saying things like that, it, it, it led to this demonizing of Jews. We know that there was a tension in the church, which, for instance, in 1492, we all know that year is the year when Columbus discovered the Americas. That was also the year in which the Catholic Church and the Catholic monarchs of Spain expelled Jews from Spain. So we've, we have long persecuted the Jewish people historically, so it should be no surprise to us that a person like Hitler, raised in this anti-Semitic culture, this anti-Jewish culture, would have these ideas. The church bears some responsibility in that. Thanks. May I talk about how Polish Catholicism came to the United States? This is fascinating because none of us None of our families originated here in the United States unless we are purely Native American, indigenous. All of our families came from other places, whether that was from Mexico and parts south, whether it was from across, the, across an ocean, whichever ocean that might have been. So Poli Polish Catholics, beginning with the Polish Revolution of 1830, large numbers of Polish immigrants began coming to the United States of America after the Polish Revolution in 1830. They started forming associations like the Polish National Committee in the U.S., which was formed in 1835, the Association of Poles in America in 1842, founded in the living room of a priest. The first Pol Polish priest was ordained in the United States in 1848. This is fascinating. This is only like 160, 170 years ago. Yeah. In 1854, now Texas comes into the scene. This becomes fascinating because there is a Polish priest who is, in, who is influencing Polish families to immigrate to the United States, and where did they come through? They didn't come through Ellis Island. He directed them through Galveston, Texas. So some of us may remember from uh, Texas history uh, a little town called Pana Maria, which is between San Antonio and Corpus Christi. Pana Maria is where the first Polish church in the United States was built. So when we think of Polish churches, we think of the Midwest and the Northeast, places like Pennsylvania, Chicago, St. Louis even. No, it was right here in Texas, between San Antonio, Corpus Christi, and Pana Maria, Texas. Yeah. And all of these Polish families started coming into Texas, into Galveston, and then from here, going to other places in the United States. So it, began, it became this uh, tremendous immigration port. In 1870, there were 20 Polish settlements in the United States, only 20 in 1870, with 40,000 Polish immigrants, a quarter of which were in Chicago, and those settlements were largely in Texas, and then up in the Midwest and the East, Michigan, Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, Pennsylvania, and Missouri. And then, do you remember the Vatican, First Vatican Council, 1870, Vatican I? The first Vatican Council was in 1870. That's when the church came up with ideas like purported papal infallibility. Infallibility and also the universal jurisdiction of the Pope, meaning that the Pope was the head of the church. This was not an idea that we had previous to 1870 but the universal jurisdiction of the Pope. This council was cut short in 1870 due to the Franco-Prussian War. And it was a result of that Franco-Prussian War then, in 1870 to 1871, that Polish immigrants just started flooding into the United States. They grew to 150,000 people in 132 churches throughout the United States, many of which were named for St. Stanislaus. Who was St. Stanislaus? Oh, you remember up above that Bishop of Krakow was killed during Mass. Where are our ambassadors, eight people from our parish, going this weekend in St. Louis to a church called St. Stanislaus, named for this saint in one of these cities. So here we have immigrants coming through the port of Galveston, through Texas. Isn't this a great link between us and our friends in St. Louis, Missouri? Here the pair of Polish immigrants coming through Texas settling in St. Louis, Missouri, founding St. Stanislaus Catholic Church 130 years ago. 
by 1907, after its founding, Chicago, and I just list some of the, the largest <coughs> cities with Polish settlements. Chicago had the largest with 81 Polish priests in 36 parishes. These are Polish-speaking priests. So this is kind of cool. You can look down the list. Milwaukee, 44 priests in 18 parishes. Buffalo, 41 priests in 21 parishes. Pittsburgh had 40 priests in 33 parishes. Scranton, where's Scranton? Pennsylvania, why is that in the news these days? Hometown of Joe Biden, a Polish settlement. And that city will be important in the history of the Polish National Catholic Church. We'll see in a moment. Scranton, 33 Polish priests in 32 parishes. 32 Polish parishes in a little town like Scranton, Pennsylvania. Green Bay, Wisconsin, 33 Polish priests in 28 Polish parishes. Detroit, 33 priests in 18 parishes. Philadelphia, 28 priests in 19 parishes. And then way farther down the list, just to give us some comparison, there were priests here in Texas, in San Antonio, we had eight Polish priests in ten Polish parishes. Let that sink in for a moment, because we think of San Antonio as a, as a Mexican-American city. Ten Polish Roman Catholic parishes served by eight priests. <clears throat> Galveston, the port town where they were coming through, eight Polish priests in eight parishes. And we see seven Polish priests making their way up to St. Louis, Missouri, where they founded six Polish parishes, one of which was St. Stanislaus. We'll just pause there. After that brief history of Polish immigration in the United States, it's kind of cool that Texas is the port through which many of these Polish immigrants were passing. Just want to get it up. Now I have something to say when we're driving, because we do a pilgrimage every twice a year to San Juan, uh -huh. and we always drive through Pat Maria. There you go. And never, I've noticed now that they have one of the biggest barbecue Polish sausage place in Pat Maria. Uh -huh. When you drive through, you see it on the right side. So now when we drive through, I'm going to tell them, hey, this is Polish. <laughs> the first Polish Catholic church in the United States. Is it and, still there? Yeah, it's still yeah, there. It's still there. Yeah. It's on the right. When you go there downtown, you. it's on the right. So as you, as you drive through there, I mean, a bit of history here in Texas. So that's why it excites me. When, when we're sending ambassadors to St. Louis this weekend, it's not just, you know, just randomly sending people to St. Louis, but it's really like it's almost retracing history, if you will. Mm -hmm. We're flying this time rather than going in wagons. <laughs> but what a cool thing that we have this trek going north, uh, mm -hmm. essentially following the paths of many Polish ancestors. Ready for the history of St. Stanislaus Kaska Polish Catholic Church in St. Louis, Missouri? This is for our ambassadors. Before you step foot at St. Stan's, to be able to understand a bit of what happened there. In an era of ethnic Catholic churches, St. Stan's was built five short blocks away from St. Leo's. So back then, you had the German parish and the Italian parish and the Polish parish, etc. We had every ethnicity had its parish because back then, most of us were speaking different languages. The Irish were speaking which language? English. Germans? German. Mm -hmm. Polish? Polish. Polish. The Poles were speaking Polish. So we had these, these communities that, which were sort of like holy family in an age before bilingual priests. Right? When you just had, it would be like Father Livardo. This would be a perfect example. Father Livardo speaks Spanish, doesn't celebrate any English masses. He has a very ethnic parish at St. Jude Thaddeus in Niederwald. Back in an age before, when priests were just arriving from foreign lands, before they were mastering English and being able to talk to one another, they would lead the communities of the immigrants from their lands. St. Leo's, why do I mention that? Because when you look at a map, St. Leo's is destroyed now, and they're building a new development where it used to be, but it's like only a few blocks away. So when I go to, when I go to St. Stan's in October myself, I look forward to sort of just walking over there, because St. Leo's, only five short blocks away, that was where my great, great, great grandfather served as a priest. Amen. Father Jamie's great, great, great grandfather was a priest. Hmm. Think about that one for a moment. <laughs> a Roman Catholic priest in St. Louis, Missouri. We know that priests are sexual beings. My, it, it is no secret in my family. My great, great, great grandmother was impregnated by a priest 
22 years older than herself, so we don't imagine that it was entirely consensual. And the Roman Catholic Church has a pattern. When something like that happens, what do we do? We simply move them. Went from the cornfields of Ohio and ended up in his later years in St. Louis, Missouri at St. Leo's, which is literally a stone's throw from St. Stan. In these Polish parishes, then St. Stan's began as a chapel for Polish immigrants in 1880. 11 years later, they formed the congregation. The congregation formed a civil corporation. So they incorporated in the state of Missouri as Polish Roman Catholic St. Stanislaus Parish. Doesn't make a lot of sense in English, but that's the name that they put on the documents. Archbishop Kenrick, who was famous during this council because Archbishop Kenrick of St. Louis spoke against papal infallibility. Great story. Archbishop Kenrick allowed the Polish people to own their own church. You know, in, in, the, the, in the Catholic Diocese of Austin, the Roman Catholic Diocese of Austin, the bishop owns every single Roman Catholic church in Austin. In St. Louis, Bishop Kenrick, who opposed papal infallibility, said, you know what, I don't need to own your buildings. If you, as a people, want to own your own buildings and your own land, you own it. So that set up this interesting dynamic where the people, instead of the church, own the land and the building. The church was built in 16 months, beginning in 1891. Imagine building, when, when you all go to St. Louis this weekend, look up at that big old church and imagine they built that 130 years ago in 16 months. Flashing forward in time, 1969, they were visited by Cardinal Carol Wojtola of Krakow. Who is that? We've heard his name before. Pope John Paul II, before he was Pope John Paul II, celebrated Mass at St. Stan's. It's probably going to be there this weekend. 1991, Archbishop John May, who was the Archbishop when I moved to St. Louis in 1990, he celebrated the centennial of the deeding of the church property by Archbishop Kenrick, so they celebrated in 1991 the 100th anniversary of the Polish people owning their own church. Pretty cool thing. 2003, Cardinal Justin Regali, who's then the Archbishop, but he was named a Cardinal, uh, blessed the new Polish Heritage Center that y'all will be visiting this weekend. 2004, the next year, they had a new Bishop, Archbishop Raymond Burke, who, this is now in the middle of the priest, the Roman Catholic priest sexual abuse scandal, and he needed money, and one way to make sure that he had the money was to make sure that every church belonged to him, and he said, okay, every church that doesn't belong to me needs to belong to me. And what did the Polish people at St. Stan say? No. This church belongs to us. In August 2004, he punished the church for not turning over its assets by removing its Polish priests. But the people continued to meet at that church every single Sunday without a priest. Mm -hmm. I love listening to Father Mark tell the story. Because you know what? They didn't have a priest, but they were still going to go to church and, you know, they do what they could. You know, let's uh, look at the readings today. Let's do what we can do without a priest. And then after they would be in the church and pray for a little bit, they'd go over to the Polish Heritage Center and they would have uh, Polish sausage and beer together. I understand they have beer on Sunday morning. You all have to tell us what that's like. <laughs> <laughs> They went for the beer. <laughs> On December 2005, 16 months later, Archbishop Burke, so the, the Polish people, appealed to a young priest in the Diocese of Gerardo Cape. I, the name is slipping my mind, but the neighboring diocese, they brought in a young Polish priest, early 30s, newly ordained almost. And his name was Father Marek Bozek. And Father Marek said, here's the people. They need a priest, I'm going to be their priest. So the Archbishop, Archbishop Burke, who is still alive over in the Vatican, he was transferred over to the Vatican, mm. who is still alive, and there's rumors of him being the next Pope. Mm. Talk to Father Marek about that, because Father Marek says it would be the best thing for independent Catholicism to have an arch-conservative like Archbishop Burke become the head of the Roman Catholic Church. Just imagine all the people who'd be running in our direction. Archbishop Burke then, on December the 17th, before Christmas, what a Christmas gift, huh? 
in 2005, excommunicated the Board of St. Stan's for not giving him the church property, and he also excommunicated and tried to deport Father Madek for serving the people. And then that led to a seven-year court battle that was resolved in 2012. Um, I shouldn't, shouldn't say seven-year court battle. It was a seven-year legal wrangling between the diocese and the people. It went to court for 18 months, and a circuit court judge ruled in favor of St. Stan's, saying, quote, the archbishop may own the, wayward, the souls of the wayward St. Stanislaus parishioners, but the St. Stanislaus Parish Corporation owns its own property. Archbishop, Archbishop Henrik in 1891 let the people own their own property. They have owned their own property to the present day. Which is why when they left the Roman Catholic Church, you'll when you go to St. Louis this weekend, you'll see this large, beautiful, formerly Roman Catholic Church, which is now part of our independent Catholic tradition. Like Holy Family St. Stan's is not affiliated with any independent Catholic jurisdiction. So they don't have any bishop that's over Father Marek. In 2019, they discussed joining the Episcopal Church. The Episcopal Church talks about how it could have old Catholic communions and, and we would be in union with the Union of Utrecht Old Catholic Churches. They were, they were on the verge, on the cusp of being the first church in the United States, in St. Louis, to join the Episcopal Church as an old Catholic church. And it didn't quite happen for one reason, principally, and that was the, the church. The Episcopal Church said, in order to join us, you just have to do one thing, sign over to the church. What did the Polish people say? Me. Uh, no. <laughs> Any questions or comments on the history of St. Stanislaus before we move to the Polish National Catholic Church, which is a, another development within the independent Catholic world? So, you're, you're saying, <clears throat> and, and Father Amish says that if this gentleman becomes Pope, he would be a benefit to the defendant. But wasn't he against some of the stuff here? He's absolutely against it. So why Father, would Father, he yeah, Father Maddox's point is because he is so conservative, there would be a lot of people who are currently self identify as Roman Catholic who would be like, oh, no, 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 no. Heck no. Can't do this. I can no longer be a Roman Catholic in, in good conscience. I need other alternatives. Oh, look, there's another church over here. We'll see. I don't think that that's going to happen. He, he will not be elected pope. But there, there, you know, there's always speculation about who the next pope will be. This is not like the King of England, where we know who's in line to be a successor, who's, who's going to be the successor. They have an election, and interestingly, uh, Pope Francis has named most of the voting cardinals of this. So right now it's just speculation who will replace him. The Polish National Catholic Church, the PNCC, we call it. This is fascinating now because this fits within, within the whole context of independent Catholicism in the United States. What we're going to see is that there are a lot of Polish people throughout the United States who've had this spirit of independence who said, we love being Catholic, we just don't like being part of the Roman Catholic Church. We want to keep our independence. And a lot of that developed because of Irish and German Roman Catholic bishops. So imagine being a Polish-speaking person with bishops who don't understand and or show the love or affection for you that you'd like, wouldn't it be nice to have your own bishop? They knew that there was no chance of getting a Polish-speaking bishop in the United States with the, with the hold that the Irish and German uh, Catholic bishops had over the United States Church. And so they ceded, uh, they, they decided to step outside the Roman Catholic Church. Father Francis Podor, Immigrated to the United States in 1893, so this is after St. Stanislaus. He was named the pastor of St. Stanislaus Catholic Church in Scranton. Where is Scranton? Pennsylvania. Oh, I love this history. St. Stanislaus, it was named after whom? I, it was named after that uh, Bishop of Krakow who was killed during Mass, uh, hero of the Polish people. And continued discontent with the Polish church led to a rupture in 1897 when some 20,000 Polish Roman Catholics decided to step outside of the Roman Catholic Church. This was huge. 20,000 people left. 
Father Hodor, 10 years later, was consecrated a bishop. So they were without a bishop for 10 years. This is a fascinating study, historically. They existed for 10 years, relying on other bishops, until finally Father Hodor was consecrated by the Union of Utrecht of the Old Catholic Churches in 1907. And then the PNCC, the Polish National Catholic Church, was part of the Union, Union of Utrecht up until 2003, almost 100 years. Why did they leave the Union of Utrecht? Because there was an issue in 1996 that divided the Union. The German church ordained two women. And the, the Dutch church was like, what'd you do? What did you just do? The German church ordained two women. The Dutch church wasn't cool with it, but they're like, okay, um, we're gonna like talk through this and find a way to work this out. The PNCC, seven years later in 2003, decided, yeah, we, we can no longer be part of this church that is ordaining women. So it's a more conservative expression of the church. The PNCC is not related to St. Stan's in any way. St. Stan's, of course, you can imagine after left the, the Roman Catholic Church, it thought, well, should we join the Polish National Catholic Church? Decided not to, largely because of its stance on women's ordination. What our ambassadors are going to go see this weekend St. Stan's is an inclusive church where people like Mother Annie are ordained priests. After Poland's independence in 1918, the TNCC established over 50 parishes in Poland. And then I'll just pause right there because that was very brief on the PNCC. But I think it's fascinating before our ambassadors go to St. Louis for us to talk about Polish customs, because in the same way that there are Mexican and Mexican-American <coughs> customs, like posadas and quinceañeras and presentaciones de tres años, there are also Polish customs, which can be a bit fascinating too. Any questions or before we jump into Polish customs? Uh, Polish Catholic customs? We'll go through the year. We'll start on Christmas Eve. On Christmas Eve, they celebrate with it says here 12 dishes, but usually it's 11 or 13 meat-free courses, usually an odd number, with the preference being for 13. 13 is a symbolic number. You may think it's an unlucky number, but how many people were at the Last Supper, according to Christian imagination? Jesus and 12 apostles. 12 plus 1 equals... Uh, so it suddenly becomes a symbolic number. December the 24th for the Polish people is more important than the 25th. It begins, the celebration begins when the first star appears in the sky. They share thin square wafers. You can find these online even uh, because they're shared by family members and friends. I have a wafer, but instead of eating away from myself, I share my wafer with everyone else in the room and I take a piece of everyone else's wafer too. What a beautiful sign of communion. This wafer is essentially like our communion wafers, but it's a like a square or rectangular flat bread made of flour and water. They eat uh, 11 or 13 meat-free courses drawn from the forest and ocean field and orchard representing the months of the year. You may have heard of pierogies, dumplings, borscht, which is a soup. They eat things like honey and nuts, beans, barley, beetroot, fruit, fungi, fish. Another interesting tradition on, on Christmas Eve is that they put straw usually under the tablecloth. So before putting the, the tablecloth on the table, they'll put straw on the table first and then put the tablecloth on top. Because when you feel the straw underneath, what does the straw remind you of? Jesus in the manger. So they'll either put it under the tablecloth or they'll put it under the table. <coughs> Uh, there are other traditions where the day began, Christmas Eve day began with girls bringing pails of water from a nearby stream to sprinkle the people and the cows to ensure healing and wealth for the year ahead. The males of the household then cut a pine tree or spruce tree and then hung it upside down over the table. So let's just understand what's happening here. So even in the in ancient times, these pagan custom was to, to take water and to sprinkle the cows and to sprinkle the people for health and for wealth in the new year, and then to hang an upside down tree over the table uh, as part of that dinner as well. Kind of interesting tradition. 
Should we move forward to Three Kings Day? What do we call it? Dia de los Reyes Magos? Uh, Epiphany. 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 What day is Epiphany? January the 6th. How many days after January the 6th? How many days after Christmas is January the 6th? That's 12 days. Have you heard any songs like that? On the 12th day of Christmas. The 12th day of Christmas would be the Epiphany, the Feast of the Three Kings. For the Polish people, it's a big day. The 12th day after Christmas the, is for them the official end of the Christmas season. They celebrate with colorful parades and costumes, nativity plays, carols, candy, fancy cakes. It's been a holiday in Poland since 2011, so it's a day off for folks. Other traditions include the chalking of doors. Oh, that's something we've done here at Holy Family, right? We give people chalk with a blessing to be able to put over the door. That served a dual purpose. One, you, anyone you see chalk over the door, you know that they're Catholic. And also, it was believed to be a talisman, you know, to have, if I do that, then there are certain uh, magical uh, things that will happen as a result of that, to keep away evil spirits, etc. Sort of like, the equivalent of Palm Sunday Palms and Candle Day Mass candles um, in Poland, warding off evil. And we have the Rosca de Reyes in the Latino culture. In the Polish culture, they also have king cakes. In their king cakes, instead of baking a figure of the, of the baby Jesus, they'll bake a coin or an almond inside, and whoever finds it is king or queen for the day. So we have some traditions in common. Mm -hmm. Fat Thursday? When is Fat Thursday? Have you heard of this before? When is Fat Tuesday? Fat Tuesday is the day before Ash Wednesday. Wednesday. So Fat Thursday is five days before that. Fat Thursday is one week before Ash Wednesday. It's sort of like signaling, uh oh, we only have one week left until Lent, so let's Let's celebrate and eat what we can before we start fasting on Ash Wednesday. So they start their fasting on, instead of Fat Tuesday, they back it up five days to Fat Thursday, where they celebrate a National Day, often for giving donuts, sugary fried pavorki with angel wing pastries, and uh, pochki donuts, mm. which are usually iced or sugared and filled with cream or fruit jam. Mm, you'll have to tell us if you have any good pastries and things. <laughs> Easter Monday. Are you ready for Easter Monday? They call it Wet Monday. Why would you call it Wet Monday? Because that's a day to throw water at people on the streets. <laughs> Easter Monday is a national holiday with surprise dousings in the streets. The date to the Middle Ages, it used to be a, a mating ceremony when the young men used to pour water on the women on the young ladies that they thought were beautiful. How does that for ladies? I don't know about children. I think the guys got along and gestures and those affected like... Water guns. Garden hoses. No, today they use garden hoses, water guns, other ways of getting people wet, but it dates to that ancient ritual of boys picking on the girls that they found pretty. <coughs> St. Andrew's Day. This is something we don't celebrate here. When is St. Andrew's Day? November the 30th, but their celebration begins on the night before, November the 29th, various fortune-telling is for the, who is St. Andrew? Do you remember who St. Andrew was? The brother of whom? Oh, one of the first disciples, Peter and Andrew, Andrew. James and John. Andrew is the one who keeps, keeps getting forgotten about. When Jesus takes three people with him, it's always Peter, James, and John, and they forget about Andrew, Peter's brother. St. Andrew then, on his day, November the 30th, which they kick off from the night before, has various fortune-telling games. Imagine this for a moment. They pour candle wax through a keyhole into cold water, and so it's, it's dripping into the water, and then they hold up that shape to see what shadow it casts against the wall, and that tells young ladies something about their future husbands. Ooh, look, it looks like a big nose. Ooh, your husband's going to have a big nose. <laughs> No, it looks like a horseshoe. Well, maybe your husband's going to be a blacksmith, right? So, that's St. Andrew's Day in Poland. Also, I like this other tradition of St. Andrew's Day. So imagine for a moment in the, uh, to, to figure out who's going to get married next, everyone takes off their shoes, and then they line their shoes up beginning at the wall across from the door. So if we're heading toward that door over there, 
I'm going to put my shoes against the wall first, and then Rudy's going to put his shoes. This is all the bachelors. In the, room. <laughs> the next bachelor puts their shoes, and then the next bachelor puts their shoes, and their shoes, and their shoes. When I get to the end of everyone's shoes, then I move my shoes up to the front of the line. It's one of these games, right? And you keep moving the shoes up, and whichever shoes go through the doorway first mm -hmm. is going to be the next person to get married. That's the St. Andrew's Day tradition. <laughs> A lot of fun, though. <laughs> so, so, fun games. I like the pouring the wax into the water. I like. Tell me what my future husband's gonna be like. <laughs> I like the wet T-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that was gonna come up. Gotta <laughs> sing of the wet T-shirt. Says Gloria. <laughs> Saint Nicholas Day. What is Saint Nicholas Day? December the sixth. On December the 6th, St. Nicholas, they say, descends from heaven, dressed in purple and, in a purple and gold robe, with a cape and a mitre, the bishop's cap, and a crozier, which is the bishop's staff. He arrives either on foot or on a white horse with goodies for well-behaved children. If you're well-behaved, you get goodies. If you're naughty, you get a switch. What is a switch used for? Yeah. Nice. Uh, that friend is sounding pretty good. I like this tradition, though. St. Nicholas makes the children recite their prayers or their catechism. Boy, imagine you have to, having to memorize your prayers because St. Nicholas is going to ask you. And then St. Nicholas shares Pianiki, heart shake, honey cookies, holy pictures, apples. And of course, if St. Nicholas is not able to visit you during the day, don't worry. He'll probably place a gift under your pillow. Questions or comments on Catholic rituals as we look at these through the lens, especially of the Mexican and Mexican American cultures. We think of some of our own cultures and traditions and think, oh, the Polish people have their own Catholic traditions as well. Ready for the pagan rituals to survive? <coughs> this becomes fascinating because before Poland was Catholic, it was pagan. So, of course, there were various religious elements and various traditions that survived from. They're pre-Christian times. One is the drowning of Marsana on the first day of spring, which is always in March, March the 19th through the 21st. They burn effigies of the Slavic witch <coughs> goddess Marsana, who is superstitiously associated with plague and death. They burn an effigy of this witch, and then they drown the witch <coughs> in, the, in the river, in the stream, just like the witch trials of old. If you Google that, you can see pictures of them burning, burning effigies of witches with people standing in a circle around them. The harvest holiday on August 15th, hired farmers create dome-shaped crowns of wheat, rye, and other grains <laughs> with flowers, ribbons, hazelnuts, which they take to the church to be blessed, then place on the head of a hard-working girl. Ooh, imagine competing to be the hard-working girl who gets to wear the crown that year. Then they pull that girl wearing the crown in a greenery decorated wagon with four horses surrounded by other girls with flowers in their hair who are singing in a procession all the way to the landowner's home. The girl shared the crown with the landowner who gave her a gift followed by dancing and refreshments sort of like their harvest festival in Poland. Mm -hmm. hmm. The Feast of Greenery celebrated on September the 8th so as the autumn is coming, we celebrate the last notes of, of, of green. Farmers bring bouquets. Oh, and that was just last week. Farmers bring bouquets of herbs, <coughs> vegetables, and flowers to the church to be blessed. And those bouquets are then kept at home until the person's names day the following year. Remember in Poland, we didn't celebrate birthdays because we didn't remember our birthdays. What day were you born? Instead, we celebrated names days because the church would tell us which saint was being celebrated. Oh, so then we would know which people were celebrating on that day. The herbs of the bouquet were brewed for medicinal purposes for people and for their cows. All Souls Day. All Souls Day we could put above with Catholic traditions, except that All Souls Day is rooted in pagan cultures, in the belief that when a person died, the spirit went out of them. So in the traditional Polish culture, 
Um, death rituals included the opening of doors and windows at the moment of passing. Ooh, when a person dies, open up the doors and the windows, and let the spirit out. The turning of mirrors toward the wall so that the souls aren't captured in the room. And a vigil to protect the dead souls from evil spirits. And then the next day we'd bury the body and celebrate with a funeral banquet. So All Souls Day, we know in the Catholic culture, is on November the 2nd. In Poland, they start celebrating the night before on November the 1st, which, of course, uh, you know, Halloween and All Souls Day are all around that time of the year where it was believed that the souls of people wandered the earth. And the last one, the Christmas or Christmas or winter solstice, is a time when they have hunter's stew, hunter's stew. It's a family day, no work. And they would believe that from Christmas, remember the 12 days of Christmas? From Christmas through January the 6th, those 12 days, they believe in the Polish culture, in the pagan Polish culture, would predict the weather for the next year. So on December the 25th, the first day, if it's sunny in the morning and then cloudy in the evening, oh, then January is going to be sunny for the first half and cloudy, rainy for the second half. Follow me? So they would sort of like, that was their ancient way of predicting the weather before the science of meteorology. Caroling, interestingly, their caroling doesn't begin until after Christmas. So after Christmas on December, on December the 26th, St. Stephen's Day, They'll start the caroling, which will go through the Feast of the Purification. In one tradition, the Sokka, young boys carry a portable manger scene from house to house as a way to make money and earn sweets. Oh, you can imagine the older ladies in the community love when the young boys come around bringing their, their manger scenes for the women to be able to express their devotion, and they reward the boys for coming around and doing that. But the other ancient caroling tradition that goes back to pagan times is that of the Turon caroling where, where at least one person, if not more, is dressed as an ox, those creatures that would come and do harm to our villages. <laughs> so as we send our ambassadors this weekend to St. Louis, Missouri, we recognize the great richness of the, the heritage, the culture of our sisters and brothers, our siblings of the Polish culture. In the Latino culture, Mexican, Mexican American cultures, we have various traditions. In the Polish culture, they have other traditions as well. So that when we're with our friends in St. Louis, we can engage them in conversation on some of their traditions. What do they do as a church? What Polish traditions do they keep alive in their church? Do they share Christmas wafers? Do they douse one another with water? If I follow Father Marek or St. Stan's uh, social media pages, we see some of these. Polish traditions from time to time. We'll pause there for questions, comments, reflections, as we get ready to send our ambassadors to St. Louis, Vincent? I just think it's uh, it's interesting that, you know, the pagan rituals, because um, true story, uh, a lot of, you know, I call him my uncle, but he's really a family friend for since my dad and him were kids at three years old. His father uh, passed away in his house, in the house. So as we're growing up, you know, we grew up with him also, and we used to call him grandfather also because he, like I said, was, you know, and uh, when he passed away, for a good two or three years, his rocking chair would move at certain times of the night. Uh -huh. And uh, everybody thought it was just, you know, everybody thought of the evilness that it was haunted and stuff like that. So one day, uh, one Christmas, we were all gathered and we had a visitor from the Polish community. And he, he was actually a musician. And we're telling him about the story. And he goes, hmm, how many people know of this story? And, we're, and he's like, well, everybody hears of it. So then the next day, he brought in a Polish priest. And we did, he was Polish-Mexican priest. But 
we did a rosary. But before we did the rosary, he asked us, this is in December, and cold, 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 he asked us to open all the windows and the doors in the house. And we did the rosary. And after that, the rocket chair stopped moving. Because his soul, they said his soul was still there at the house, that when he passed away, all the doors were closed. And that's how he explained it, all the doors were closed. They didn't have time to go. And with this rosary and him doing this ritual, you know, the rocking chair stopped. We either we didn't notice that it was moving anymore, or we forgot about it, or it actually just stopped. And it was because we opened all the doors and windows and had the rosary at, the, at that time. That's because of cultural beliefs. I was going to inform that uh, there there are painted churches. You you know about that, the right? Painted churches in Texas. Out here in in uh, Central Texas, uh -huh. the, the painted churches. I, I thought it was Pana Maria. Uh, I don't know whether it's included. Uh, Pana, the Polish church. Right, right. Um, I'll look it up and find out whether it's Pana Maria. Did you say painted? A lot of the painted the churches, painted in churches. Texas are ethnic churches, right? A lot of these immigrant communities. There's some word out. Paint scenes, scenes in their churches. Sure, I yeah. think it's sure, Lockhart yeah. and going towards Lockhart. There's a, a Polish uh, church somewhere yeah. out there. And uh, there's quite a few uh, painted churches here. I, I, I yeah. guess you know uh, all about that. Czech churches, various ethnicities. They call them the painted ones churches because they're very colorful. I know there's one in Kennedy, also going down towards the valley. Mm -hmm. In Kennedy, in the city town, in the town of Kennedy, there's a painted church there as well. Now for one night, we pray in a special way for all of our ambassadors who are going forth to St. Stanislaus Kaska. Polish Catholic Church in St. Louis this weekend. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, a world without end. Amen. Amen. Yay, and happy anniversary to St. Stan's.